Good afternoon all. A warm welcome to the program, International Training and Intensive Program. Uh, this is Mukesh from Tech Counselor team, and I welcome to all the audience as well as my expert and Dr. Samwal, uh, Ms. Pranka, as well as to Navin Kumar sir. Thank you for accepting our request to the session. I am very much thankful to Tulas Institute of Technology and to the Tech Counselor group for organizing such a wonderful program. Then we have our co-organizer, co Krishna Institute of Medical Science, deemed to be university from Maharashtra. We also have uh, Uttarakhand Technical University with us as a technical partner. And for the industry and uh, technical part, for the knowledge partner and technical partner, we have Yuvana Tech and Craft Private Limited, Ramanathan Academy of Science and Technology. Then we have Swachnir Group with us. Uh, also, we have Baudhik Ventures providing IP support. And then we have Kaviraj Foundation, uh, our CSR partner, and Trites. So I am I'm, I'm very much thankful for my, for my whole team for organizing this wonderful session, which we started on 20th of June and will be going on till 15th of July. Uh, Samuel, sir, can you put the next slide? Yeah. So we we have conducted this program in line with the government of India vision and mission to make India a global R&D hub. So we have various experts, and uh, we already have conducted seven seminars for, for so far. Uh, we will. We already had um, Mr. Badat Madan Kanala, who is the founder and CEO for SnowM, Ottawa from Canada. We also had Dr. Raman Sarma, who is the senior scientist at CSR. Then we had Dr. Rajkumar Helder, who is the CEO and founder for Rivenal Biomedical OPC Private Limited from New Delhi. Uh, we had very senior professor, Professor uh, Dr. Manoj Panda, who is the uh, professor at Govind Balla Pant Institute of Engineering Technology, as well as state project advisor, uh, administrator for, for uh, state project implementation well unit, Uttarakhand. So yesterday we had Navin Kumar sir with us. Oh, sorry, uh, today we have Navin Kumar uh, with us. He's a research engineer uh, working at uh, one of the lab in France. Then we will also have Sipar the Prasad in the coming days, Vinay Chaudhary. A very senior professor, Dr. Sunil Sehwal, who is the FOD and professor at Electrical Engineering, Tulaz Institute, Tehradun. Also, Ajit Kumar Yadav, researcher at uh, NISA project, a joint initiative between NASA and ISRO, will also be joining us. He is the founder for Ramanujan Academy of Science and Technology. Uh, also, Sarat Trivedi, sir, has already given lecture on IP and its value, uh, its addition for the startups. He is the founder and director for Baudhik Ventures Private Limited. Udayavir Mittal will be joining Hello. We'll be, Hello. We'll be hosting. Yes, sir. Ah, okay. Hello. Yeah. So I I, I will hand over the session to Dr. Sunil Samwal to kindly introduce uh, Navin Kumar sir for the session, and uh, we hope that this will be a uh, like wonderful session uh, for uh, for the expert and for our audience. So handing over to uh, to you, sir. Oh, no. Thank you, Mukesh. Uh, I am Dr. Sunil Seymal, Organizing Secretary of this event. Today we have with us uh, uh, research engineer Mr. Naveen Kumar. He is working in France in a reputed uh, laboratory and working in the area of antenna for railway design. The project is a shift to rail project in which he is working uh, as a research engineer. Mr. Naveen received his master degree, oh, sorry, his uh, PhD degree from uh, Thapar Institute of Technology and master degree from NITRTR Chandigarh in 2013. He is BTEC from SBIET Punjab and he is an innovator, he is a researcher in the area of uh, antenna design. He has several paper in IEEE uh, transaction and reputatory general and his 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 currently his uh, work is antenna design and mimo antenna and wireless communication so uh, i am hand overing the session to mr navin kumar hello sir yeah thank you thank you dr Sainval. uh thank you the organizers uh, i'm happy to be here and thank you for inviting inviting me to share my experience, uh, some insights that I have in the field of uh, 
antennas which are being used uh, worldwide for different applications and nowadays we are having so many devices around us which are communicating with each other right so making a smart home a smart city uh, around us right so thank you very much uh, tech counselor the organizers tulas institute and the other partners who are supporting this event so i'll be starting off with the presentation by sharing my screen and you confirm if the screen is visible is it right visible hello visible hello hello ah okay visible. thank you thank you very much i was just waiting not, for the feedback not, not visible yes not visible the screen is not visible not visible yes. ah okay okay one second i'll just Okay, I guess now it should be. Yes, uh, now visible. Is it now visible, visible now? Yeah, yeah, yes. Antenna okay. for IoT and uh, where? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So I can start now. Yeah. Yeah, correct, correct. Thank you, thank you very much. So I'll start now. First of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, those who are watching uh, this webinar from different parts of the world. And uh, the the topic, the talk that I'll be having today. is on antennas for iot and wearable devices for connected world i am working uh, here as a research engineer in france in the lab which is the institute of research and technology relenium and uh, the company actually works in the area of railway transport the research in that area specifically working on different projects which are national which are from france as well as on the european level so there are many contributors partners which are working in collaboration with this lab to design and develop uh, new technologies or new innovations which will be there uh, in the coming years uh, to be used in railways as well as for the passengers who will be using the railway system so uh, to start with this will be the outline of the presentation and before that i'll just uh, say a special hi to someone who is watching this uh, webinar so to start with the outline will be uh, to have a brief idea what is the connected world what do we mean by connected world and then going forward with the iot basics uh, how we understand the iot uh, domain as well as the antennas used in these iot technologies uh, next what are the antenna requirements a very brief uh, discussion about it about it because we uh, i know that uh, the audience will be from different genres and different domains so it will be easier for them to understand if you'll we'll just touch on these topics so uh, the antenna requirements specifically for the iot devices then we move on to wearable antennas which is actually a special case uh, in iot umbrella so wearable antenna is nothing much is just a special usage of iot systems which we can wear or which we can carry with our, uh, ourselves so some basics about wearable antennas the uh, inside uh, structures and how, how they work and also the requirements specifically for the wearables because we will be carrying them or we will be having them uh, on our body so what are the specific requirements and finally the conclusion of the talk so uh, to start with uh, let's see what is the connected world what does it mean to us so connected world is basically all about uh, what we hear these days the new terms uh, like iot uh, ai artificial intelligence deep learning machine learning um, we are also hearing something like uh, satcom uh, which is like uh, approachable to common public companies like spacex uh, they are developing the very very interesting project starlink in the last few weeks they there was some buzz about it they were launching um, hundreds of satellites forming a satellite network in the lower earth orbit which we call leo so that they can connect they can provide broadband services uh, to the public quite easily and there are some other companies also who are having this kind of uh, vision who are already working on it who are deploying a large number of satellites small satellites which we call cubesats a very small 10 cm by 10 cm size uh, satellite and we have hundreds of them in the orbit and through that we can have the internet available so a connected world is to have everything 
with us, around us, being connected. Whether it's about the transport that we use, the car that we drive, the devices that we use at home or in the office, the hospitals being uh, smart, the buildings being smart, everything being uh, connected or communicating with each other, getting information, giving information, processing information. So all in all, connected world is to have everything connected with each other. And in this way, we can also term uh, this thing, this idea to be internet of everything, which is IOE. It means humans connected with machines or devices or gadgets, and they are also being interconnected with each other. So this forms an, in, uh, an interesting concept, which we call internet of everything, right? So in this fascinating world, in this always changing uh, world, uh, the things that we are getting these days, new innovations, new products, we are seeing that this is becoming reality. Whatever we, we saw in the last decades in movies, Hollywood movies or some sci-fi fiction, uh, we are experiencing, experiencing all of that. Uh, whether it be like a smartphone, using smartphone for doing stuff, getting stuff, monitoring stuff, and operating stuff, operating our household items like lighting, air conditioner, uh, cars. So we can do that by, by our smartphones. So in that sense, we are on the path of being connected. And in the coming years, with the introduction of 5G uh, being deployed all around, we will be seeing much more of these kind of connections or these kind of uh, uh, networks. Uh, uh, around us. So moving ahead, uh, we can start with the IoT basics and the antennas, which are being used uh, in these. Very brief, a, a very a general introduction to all these uh, topics and uh, domains. So to start with, uh, this uh, slide can give you a better picture. What are the drivers of Internet of Things? What are the requirements or we can say backup technologies or backup uh, things that we need to drive the Internet of Things innovation or productions of so many products. So to start with, if we see here, first thing is uh, 3GPP standards. Although as of now, there, are, there is not one international standard which we say that it is for Internet of Things. Uh, the the uh, association or the alliance, sorry, the alliance 3GPP is actually working towards different standards. They are releasing every year some modifications in different standards like in 4G, 5G, as well as Wi-Fi, they have introduced uh, special sections or standards uh, specifically for IoT, the, the IoT operation protocols and everything. So we need that standards for sure. We have to have that. Then we have to have expanded internet connectivity. It's not like uh, we will have all these things, all these devices, and still people in many countries are not connected. They are not using internet very much. So with the advent of new technologies, with the introduction of uh, new communication technologies, uh, with the upcoming 5G, we are looking forward to connect everyone, to have everyone be on the internet, right? With the smartphones being cheap, with the technologies being accessible and the data rate uh, being cheap, we, we, uh, uh, we, we think that, or we estimate that, I guess everyone will be connected. And in that sense, we will have the proper usage of this internet of things uh, working all fine. Then we should have high mobile adoption. It is linked with the, uh, uh, again, with the popularizing uh, concept of uh, everyone being connected. So high mobile adoption means, again, everyone has to have a smartphone. Have, everyone has to be connected, having the internet connection on the smartphone. And in that sense, it will make the whole IoT network, IoT uh, uh, domain. Then along with that, IoT is not just about things being connected to internet. I'll, I'll, in the coming slide, I'll explain a bit the difference between all these terms. So it's not about just things being connected, objects being connected to internet. It's about uh, having sensors, having devices which will gather data, which will acquire data, and on which processing can be done. So low cost sensors is also a, a driving force to IoT. If there will be a low cost sensor availability, uh, there will be much more uh, uh, IoT devices coming up. There will be variety of devices which will be there in the market from different companies, of course, and different kind of sensors in them. Then, of course, from the companies, from the developers, from the product uh, manufacturers, there has to be a large IoT investment required. Already companies like Qualcomm, Intel, Samsung, and many, many, many big names are investing in their uh, productions in their manufacturing methodologies 
to be ready for the IoT demand because uh, a lot of processing power, a lot of uh, uh, sensors, and so many different sections and ICs will be required when an IoT system will be uh, developed for a particular product or for a, for a particular uh, application. So a large uh, amount of IoT investment will be required from big players as well as from the startups who will be working in this domain. There are already hundreds of startups in the IoT domain, but in future, we'll be requiring uh, them to uh, game up a bit and to increase their investment for sure, because the public demand will, will increase uh, as the number of devices will increase, right? Then uh, uh, there is another uh, driver, which is global application trends. It means uh, in particular country, in a particular region, what kind of applications are required? What kind of specific devices which are needed? So in that sense, it drives innovation. It drives the local startups and uh, companies to manufacture internet of things. So global application trends is another driving force. Then we have emergence of new technologies, as I mentioned, 5G coming up uh, to our cities and to our countries. Many of the world cities have already deployed the 5G networks and many of others will also be deploying in the coming months and next year for sure. So with the emerging new technologies, we are sure that we'll be getting much more stable and reliable as well as fast uh, network in terms of data as well as in terms of uh, efficiency. So this also leads to the Internet of Things development. And then again, another important term in Internet of Things is big data. It's about data anal analytics or data processing. Because sensors does what? They, they gather data, they gather some physical information and they produce it in the data form and that has to be processed. So there is a big importance of uh, automation as well as big data analytics and knowledge that drives Internet of Things. Then we have the very popular terms uh, these days, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which will also drive Internet of Things in the coming uh, months. It, there are already so many devices and gadgets available which forms Internet of Things and works on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Then we have another important uh, term from uh, computers, which is edge computing. And cloud is, a, I guess everyone knows cloud, what is that? But there is another term, edge computing, which is basically a distributed computing, means you will have multiple devices uh, giving their computation power. And with that power, the computation, along with the local data storage, which is present to the location where it is required, forms an edge computing. That's why the term edge. Edge is for like uh, a local uh, region or local space where you have the computation as well as the data storage, both present there. It's not like there is a remote server, remote storage, and you have a computation with you, and then you communicate over the network. Both the things should be local. So that forms edge computing. And cloud, we all know, everything available on cloud can be shared worldwide uh, quite easily, and it can be shared between devices. Then we have uh, some use cases across uh, various domains, vertical domains. Here we mean that uh, we have so many uh, engineering fields or domains or different areas of life where we'll be having use cases of uh, Internet of Things or devices based on that. And it's, it's possible that one kind of a device can be applicable to multiple domains. So we will have multiple use cases ar uh, around that, and that drives the development of Internet of Things. Then another important aspect, which is being uh, worked on, and computer guys are, I guess, they are onto it. It's about the security aspect. The security assurance using the gadgets and devices is very important. If you are connected to internet and you are using your gadgets and devices, you are communicating with them, then security is foremost. Foremost, and it is very important for uh, privacy of everyone, right? Then we have a, a, a new uh, internet protocol uh, version six that I guess we are we are already using it uh, in day to day life. I guess in the last few years we have all, already transformed our websites and network on this version. So IoT will also be benefiting from it, IPv6, so that more number of devices can be connected. There will be billions of devices which will be there in the world in the coming years based on IoT. And of course, it will require the IP addresses. So IP version 6 will drive that uh, uh, large support of devices. Then we have another important uh, concept, which is open source for 5G. 5G is being standardized 
uh, standardized. Uh, 5G is being developed. 5G is being deployed. Yes. But there is another uh, section of industry which work, which is working on having some open source technologies for 5G. What is, what is open source? Open source is like uh, to have something software or hardware, information about it available to everyone. And uh, anyone can work on it and modify it as per their own requirement. So for 5G networks also, or 5G technologies or protocols or modulation schemes, anything in 5G, if it beams open source or some section of be, uh, it beams open source, it will help to have more uh, customized solutions. It will ha help us to have more focused solutions in terms of IoT. So this whole uh, uh, group of things or drivers will help, help us to have a more focused, dedicated, specialized IoT devices and gadgets uh, to be available to us, affordable, and then we can use them uh, for our day-to-day -day operations, right? So moving forward, uh, this will just give you a simplified uh, IoT topology, uh, how it is arranged overall. And on the bottom side, you can see the different layers. Those who are from computers and electronics, they can understand there are several layers in the uh, open source uh, uh, model that we have, interface model. So we have device layer, data uh, center, and app layer and application layer. So uh, in, in on the left side, you can see there are things we call things in IoT, right? So things are actually the uh, gadgets or devices or the circuits, which has sensors, actuators. Sensors are those who gather data, who uh, converts data into digital form. And actuators are those who works on that data, who gets commands, to do something, right? To do some operation. So some brief uh, application areas can be industrial, in the industries, can be home, having several kind of devices at home being operated and being connected. And some wearables like smartwatches or smartphones or some trackers and those kind of stuff. So all these things uh, being there, having sensors and actuators as well. And then they are connected to uh, networks. Like in the first example from industry, we can see we can have short range connectivity using Zigbee technology. Zigbee is also very popular among, I guess, uh, project makers or even in the industry, it's, it's quite popular. It's uh, a short range connectivity technology working on 2.4 gigahertz as Wi-Fi. And it gives uh, an option to have a large number of devices being connected in a short range uh, domain. So that uh, through that connectivity, the industrial sensors or things will be connected to an industrial gateway, which is basically a router kind of a thing. And after which it can be connected to uh, the internet because everything has to be connected to internet, right, in the end. So it can be connected to internet by using some long range connectivity, which is most popularly nowadays is LTE, 4G. And in the coming years, it will be 5G, right? So through that, it can be connected to internet. And finally, it can, connect uh, to data centers or data servers where the data can be stored. Because it's not possible to have a large amount of data being stored locally all the time. So data centers or data servers are required, uh, provided by several big companies like Amazon, Google, and all those names. So we will have security, networking, storage, memory provided by that data center, especially. And finally, some business applications can be there, which can work on that data and can, can provide us some information or some uh, processed results. Second case can be wearables. Again, it, uh, through uh, wearables, we can say that uh, uh, the home home uh, devices, we can say that in our home, we have AC, TV, some, uh, uh, we can say refrigerator, some more devices like uh, smart speakers and all. They're all connected to internet through the local router that we had, have in our home, provided by some service provider which are local telecom companies. And finally, again, that, that kind of data which is gathered by these devices can also be stored in the data center. And finally, from the wearables that we use, I guess most of us are quite exposed to these kind of technologies these days. So we are using all these uh, smartwatches or trackers with us every day. So that can be connected, as you know, that can be connected to our mobile phone first, uh, which is a short range connectivity, mostly uh, via Bluetooth. And further through mobile phone, it gets connected to internet. And of course, in the end, the data can be again stored to the servers, the specific uh, servers of the app companies that we use, 
or again to the big servers of uh, big names like Amazon and Google. So this is a simplified topology of how an IoT, IoT scenario or IoT uh, network works. And the most common kind of uh, technology, if, if we see here the connection technologies on the top right, they are the Bluetooth uh, low energy or low power, the special version for IoT. Uh, Zigbee, Z-Wave, another variation of Wi-Fi, uh, which is for short range connectivity. Then we have this technology, which is also called uh, Wi-Fi Hello. Again, it is for low power operation, especially for IoT. And then we have NFC. I guess most of the smartphones also have this uh, near field communication, NFC uh, thing through which we can pay without having the credit card with us, or we can transfer files into the nearby phones. So all these kind of stuff. So moving ahead, the types of products in IoT. So in IoT domain, um, we can start with the, the products uh, which we call smart. These kind of products are being used, uh, I guess, since last couple of decades. We are using these products already. Uh, they are connected to internet and they have some sensors and they show some data or some information out of it, that's it. So they are smart. We are connected to internet and they do some kind of uh, data gathering. But then we have connected uh, products or connected devices. Connected is just being connected to internet, that's it. There is nothing else that uh, is being done through that uh, object or gadget. It's just that it's connected to internet, that's it. So this is another kind, but IoT is actually uh, both like smart, connected, as well as it has third component, which we call software defined product, SDP. So there is always a software or we can say brain in our IoT product, which does or which manages all these operations. So IoT product will be connected, yes. IoT product will be smart, yes, based on software code or algorithm that we have in it. So the main function of an IoT product is to collect data, transform data, uh, getting all the values from physical sensors and all, and then transforming it in, into digital form, and then processing it there will also be some kind of a processing if it will be required. And finally, having that data uh, processed and getting some uh, information out of it and having that information used to drive something like actuators or displaying something that we want to see. So this is how it works. So a brief example can be uh, the smart post that we use uh, for tracking our steps. So it has the sensor, a gyro sensor in it. So when we walk, the gyro sensor, because of the movement, it uh, gets the uh, count of steps that we are taking. Uh, the movement is a physical thing. The sensor is detecting it. It is counting the steps based on it. And that those kind of pulses that it gets from the movement is being converted into digital pulses or digital uh, bits. And those bits are being counted by the internal processing circuitry. And finally, we are just seeing a number being increased, the, the numerical values being increased on our smartphones or maybe in the watch itself. So in this way, this uh, IoT uh, device works. It has three these three components, which is uh, sensors, gathering data, processing unit, which processes that, and finally these actuators or displaying unit, all being uh, connected to internet. Now to go into antennas, uh, that is like quite interesting maybe to some of you, like uh, to go into antennas because these are most important uh, components in these devices because if they have to be connected to internet, of course they have to have uh, a medium to connect to the internet. So antennas are the components which, which connects wirelessly to other devices as well as the internet in the end, of course. So I'll just give you a brief perspective of, on antennas uh, here. On, in this slide, we can see there are two antennas. On the left, there is a very popular Yagi Ura antenna and this kind of antenna we were using, I guess, few years or few decades back before the advent of dish uh, television, dish TV based television. So these kind of antennas are like quite big. They are quite uh, large as we see the size uh, here, the dimensions here the length, width, and height, or thickness of the antenna. And on the right side, we can see a very small chip-based, ceramic chip-based antenna, which is of this dimension, which is just 10 mm by 3.2 by 1.5 mm, which is very, very, very small. It's like one centimeter by three mm, very small, like a grain of rice, right? 
So if we see both of these antennas and we get a get a perspective that both of these antenna works on 2.4 gigahertz, which is popularly the frequency for Wi-Fi that we use. Okay. So both of these antennas worked on the same frequency, but their size is so different. It's like almost uh, 100 times the size on the antenna on the left has compared to the antenna on the right. So why is it so? It is basically depending on the application that you want the antenna to be used for. It means uh, the left side antenna can be used uh, for the outdoor connections, outdoor coverage of a larger area with the Wi-Fi network, Wi-Fi signals, so that it can cover maybe 10, tens of kilometers uh, in a compound in a city. It will have higher gain. We, we compare gain in terms of uh, uh, the coverage that an antenna can have. So with this big size, working on the Wi-Fi uh, frequency, we can have larger coverage and like uh, more devices can be covered. But with the antenna on the right, this antenna is specifically designed for a device or a gadget, which will be used for IoT or which will be used for like smart operations or smart uh, product. So it has to be very small because overall the device will be very, very small. It will be just like few centimeters in size, right? So the antenna itself has to be very small compared to the device. So that's why even working on the same frequency, 2.4 gigahertz, we will be having this kind of antenna also, which is very, very small, very miniaturized, uh, still operating on that frequency and giving its uh, uh, best to operate on that frequency, but it will be only applicable to a very small device, which will, be, which will be connected to a local internet or local network. Uh, can be a Wi-Fi in a home, can be a Wi-Fi in an industry uh, building uh, floor. So that's why it will not require such uh, high values of certain antenna parameters. So this is just to give you your perspective that antennas can be very big working on the same frequency and can be very, very, very small based on the application, right? So moving forward, these are the basic requirements uh, for the antenna designs that we need for IoT specifically. I have just selected very few that we can understand. Every one of us can understand quite easily. The first requirement is uh, based on the shape and size. So it depends on the shape and size of the product actually. If the product will be a smartwatch, then the antenna can be uh, as the one as that I showed you in the previous slide. If the product can be uh, something that we will be uh, using in a smartphone, the antenna can be a bit bigger. If a product can be very, very small sensor, which is like uh, all just like one centimeter in size, overall the antenna has to be much smaller than the product itself, right? So it all depends on the product that we want in the end and the application. Finally, uh, after deciding this, we can see how to place the antenna on a device, where to place and how to place. Now this uh, point is again uh, is again related to the shape and size or height of the device. How big, how thick the antenna you want to be, how uh, long and wide the antenna you want to, to be in the product. And accordingly, you have to have the best placement on the device because the device will contain several ICs, battery, if it is a battery operated device, there will be some uh, other circuit components like uh, converters, which is uh, digital to analog, analog to digital converters. There will be some processing units. There will be some sensors itself on the device embedded all in a same platform. So we have to find the optimal placement for our antenna also so that it will not be uh, affecting those components as well as those components not affecting the antenna operation. So everything has to be analyzed, optimized. Uh, another thing is the frequency of operation. Of course, there are many technologies on which IoT products works. Uh, I have discussed few in the previous slide. slides. Uh, so Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and ZigBee, and Z-Wave on all these names. So the frequency of operation depends on the technology that we want to use for our product. So that again decides the size of antenna and this, uh, several other antenna parameters. So everything is interlinked and overall the antenna engineers or developers has to take care of all these things. Then based on the frequency of operation or I'll say the technology, uh, the data throughput is another requirement, right? Uh, as per the application, uh, sorry, as per the application, uh, what is the data throughput or data rate uh, I need or my device will need? 
uh, is it a high data rate? Is it like high data rate connectivity that my device will be requiring? Or is it like just a sensor operation, just like a small amount of data being transmitted every now and then? So based on that, we can decide the technology and the data throughput can be according to that. It can be several Mbps, which is megabytes per second, megabits per second, and it can be Kbps, which is kilobits per second. So it depends. It's not like we always need high data rate for everything. We will be needing very low data rate also. We will be needing very high data rate also, depending on the technology. Next comes the coverage. Now the coverage is again uh, in terms of area that is served by the IoT device or that we can say the IoT device can operate in. Okay, so coverage again depends the technology that we'll be using or the application domain that we'll be having. If we are using an IoT device for agricultural applications, it can be several hectares. If we'll be having an IoT device for our homes, it can be just a very small area within our home, a living hall or bedroom, hall and kitchen, everything. An apartment area. If it will be for an industrial application, it will be a big plant, industry plant. So the coverage depends on the application. And again, further on the technologies and the other requirements, right? Frequency oper operation and all. Then we have mobility. Do we uh, need the IoT device to be mobile? Mobile means it will be moving all the time. Like we use our smartwatch. We are running, we are walking. So we are using it, uh, using it on the move. So it has to be uh, having, it has to have the mobility or not. Or in the industry, the device are installed on several uh, sections of the industrial plant. So it is fixed. So this also has to be decided while developing a product. So for antenna, it all matters. All these point matters and these all need to be taken care, taken care of and these all needs to be well optimized and efficiently designed. So uh, moving forward with uh, this, uh, I can discuss briefly about all the solutions, all the technologies that are available. So we discussed about uh, throughput and range and all those things, the frequency. So we can see here, there are some short range connectivity for uh, small area coverage. Uh, as I discussed in a home, in an industrial plant, so small area, not like uh, uh, kilometers of uh, area to cover. So first uh, we have Wi-Fi Halo or Halo. Now this uh, technology is simply, uh, we have a special version of uh, uh, IEEE standard 802.11 AH. So here AH is being used as the first two letters and low is for the low power operation. So this uh, standard is specifically designed for operation of IoT devices, especially to serve IoT uh, networks or IoT solutions. So it, it is uh, working in the different domains of frequency range and mostly in the sub one gigahertz range, which is like uh, 800, 900 megahertz of range. So till now we uh, knew that Wi-Fi works on 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz band. But Wi-Fi also has some uh, technologies or standards being developed for one gigahertz or sub one gigahertz band. The range that it can support maximum is one kilometer and the maximum throughput it can support is 40 Mbps. So for high data rate communication or applications, this is really good. And the power consumption is very low. Of course, for all these technologies, the power consumption will be very low. They are designed to do that. They are designed to support low power devices. And some of the common uses can be smart lighting in the industrial plants or in the industrial compounds even. Then smart heating, ventilation, and air conditioning units that we have in our, in our industrial plants or industrial buildings. Or even our educational institutes or big universities and all those application areas, right? And for some of the security systems also within those compounds or within those uh, uh, areas of the um, city. Next comes Bluetooth, but LE, which is low energy or low power in the end, of course. So it works on 2.4 gigahertz. It supports maximum of 200 meters and it supports maximum data rate of up to 2 Mbps. Mostly uh, used in mobile phones or gaming uh, consoles or gaming devices and also for wearables like our smartwatch or smart trackers. Uh, another technology, uh, which is Z-Wave, works in the sub one gigahertz band, supports almost the same 100 meters maximum range. But the data is it, rate is very slow for applications which don't require very high data rate. So such applications can be against smart lighting in our homes, uh, thermostats in our homes, smart locks, smart sensors in our homes, 
uh, for like uh, presence detection and all those things, right? And then we have Zigbee. As I said, it operates on 2.4 gigahertz and has the range as 100 meter data rate, almost 250 kbps. Again, can be used for smart lighting, lighting controls, smog detectors, CO2 detectors, which are installed in our homes. In the modern housing uh, uh, designs, these detectors are also there. Smoke and CO2 detectors for fire detection and all. Then we have uh, this NFC, which is, uh, I guess, available in many smartphones these days, like from Samsung, the series that they have. So this works on this uh, frequency range, very, very, very low compared to the others, right? 13.56 megahertz. It covers only 10 centimeter, very near field communication, very near range communication. And it supports a good amount of data rate, around 424 kbps. And it is mostly used for commerce, uh, commerce application like payments through your phones, right? Without uh, having your card swiped and all, and in your smartphones and automations and all, right? So these are, these are all short range connectivity. And we also have applications which requires long range connectivity. Again, IoT devices being deployed there, operating in kilometers of range and radius. So all these common names like GSM, which is 2G, then LTE category one, then extended GSM, which is specially for IoT, they have uh, designed it. The ITU has specially designed this standard or developed this standard for IoT. Then LTE category narrowband one for narrowband IoT operations. Uh, a specific uh, LTE spectrum is assigned for this. LTE category one for machine operations, as enhanced machine operations. And then we have low range, a long range wireless uh, wide area network, which is LoRaWAN. And then we have Sigfox. So uh, out of these, uh, the GSM and 4G LTE networks are actually operating in different spectrums depending on the region. Region here is the country because different countries have their different spectrums assigned by ITU, International Telecommunication Union. They can operate up to hundreds of kilometers and they have uh, all these variable of speeds. All these uh, technologies have these kind of data rate that they support. But uh, in in terms of 2G, we can say that it consumes, uh, the devices consume higher power because of the whole structure or architecture or operation of this uh, technology. So these can be used uh, in smart metering or asset tracking, uh, like in the tracking and uh, uh, delivering businesses and also for some sensors. Then we have the enhanced GSM or LT standards, which operates consuming low power. And they can be used in hospitalized, like for health monitoring, smart cities, as it can cover the whole city, right? And also some for some of the sensors uh, which are deployed in like a very large area. Now these two technologies are covering larger areas, but they support a uh, very low data rate. So they are for the applications which does not require a very high data rate support. So this uh, long range wide area network operates in sub one gigahertz range, which is which is again like 900 megahertz or 800 megahertz. Or uh, it can cover this much of uh, area and data rate is very low as we can see. And the power consumption is also very low. So in that sense, the devices can be there for a very long time. Maybe years of operation can be obtained from such devices operating in this technology. So these can be used for logistics, uh, utilities, uh, can be used in smart cities, of course, which can be installed and for years they can operate uh, before replacing them. Of course, in industrial IoT, which we also call I-square IoT, uh, I OT or IIoT. This is the term that we are using these days. So on industrial IoT also, these uh, technologies can support to have IoT enabled networks there. And Sigfox is another popular technology is being, being used or being uh, deployed in asset tracking, mobile health, e-health, or remote monitoring of certain parameters. So moving ahead with all these technical things or technical terms, let's go in the application area. So here we can dive into some interesting uh, things which are there in the market, which are given to us by some of the researchers. So this first one is a living IoT. Example of having a living thing carrying an IoT device, which is here a bumblebee, a honeybee, we can say. So uh, some researchers from uh, University of Washington has developed this a few years back. They have proposed this uh, thing, having a, an IoT device attached to a bumblebee or a honeybee, and through which they can uh, monitor 
the surrounding areas. They can have the localization, behavior of the honeybee studied, and they can also have some other parameters being observed as per the sensor installed on the IoT device. So initially they installed like temperature sensors and some localization sensors. So here we can see a comparison of this IoT device, the size of IoT device compared to a, a American cent, only one cent coin, and a zoomed in version of this device that they developed. There are some switches, an antenna present here, and a processing unit, microcontroller unit, some uh, more components here, electronic components, and uh, some sensors here. This is actually a temperature sensors sensor that they use. So overall weight of this circuit, this device, is only 102 milligram, and out of which the battery that they had to use is covering most of the weight. So it's like 70 milligram of the battery uh, that they had to use, and it's a rechargeable battery. So th for the antenna, if I'll focus here, for the antenna, uh, the antenna is like a, a wire antenna, which is like having seven turns and then a long wire uh, being there. So this antenna operates uh, on a certain frequency, it's like uh, 2.4 gigahertz, and through which it can transmit to the nearby receivers, and they can get the, get the data from the sensors. So wherever the bee goes within the 80 to 100 meter of radius, they can get the data from it. And to charge the device, they, they had some solutions for the battery. So to charge the battery, they use the RF energy harvesting concept, like RF charging concept, but which we are using these days for our mobile phones, right? So for this battery, they also developed this kind of a thing, uh, RF uh, charger, which wirelessly charges the battery. They also proposed like another thing to have a, sol a solar panel or very small, like almost this sized solar panel installed on a PCB and through which the battery can charge or through which the device can operate. So in the sunlight uh, environment, sunny environment, the device can operate through a solar powered uh, circuit also. So there is, a no, there is no need of battery and the weight of the battery can also be eliminated from the device. So uh, now the question arises, uh, what about like the animal rights? <laughs> the agencies comes uh, uh, always like uh, to save the animals from all these uh, machines being installed on them or they are being monitored or tracked. But actually there is this institutional animal care and use committee, which has some guidelines and based on that or following that, they had done this experiment. And uh, it's not like the, the animal or the uh, bee has to carry it uh, uh, carry a heavy thing uh, or a heavy device, they are uh, capable of or they are used to carry this much of weight quite easily. So it's not like they are carrying a heavy thing all the time with them or it, it hinders their day-to-day -day life or their day-to-day uh, -day operations, right? Flying and everything. So the device was also optimized as per the flying uh, pattern of the bee and the bee can also carry. The bee is capable of carrying this much of weight. So there is no interference uh, between these two things, an IoT device and a living thing. So moving ahead, uh, one interesting application. Um, another one is smart agriculture. This is also uh, like coming up as a buzzword these days. So this is just a brief example uh, I took, which is having a greenhouse, which is smart. So in this uh, basic description, we can see that we have some uh, cloud infrastructure, which is like uh, connected to internet and all. And then we can have some remote commands through it, or we can use smartphone to remotely give some commands or operations. And there will be a gateway, which will be wirelessly connected to the smartphone as well as the cloud or internet. And monitoring can be there. The data or the sensors which are giving us some data can be monitored here after processing. And finally, the connection gateway can be connected to the greenhouse, which has some sensors and actuators. As I told you, IoT requires these. And further, some controls and switch gear, which is like to operate the devices and stuff which is there in the greenhouse. So what are the sensors? They are like sensors to see the light uh, in the greenhouse, to see the air flow and air quality, to have the blowers or fans being operated there, and for the water to use the pumps and all whenever required. So based on the data from such sensors like uh, light, humidity sensor, 
uh, for air, there can be a quality sensor and all. So based on the data from these sensors and processing that data, and also referring to the acceptable values and values that we need always in a greenhouse, we can have that monitor and accordingly we can give commands to operate the actuators, which is like the blower fans, the water pumps and the light uh, lighting units. So all of this can contribute to have a smart agriculture. It's not like a, a person has to be there all the time to go there multiple times a day and check carefully, physically everything, if it's all working fine. So this can all be done. And another addition that I also thought of is to have a camera, which is enabled through backed up by a AI software through which you can observe the crops the plants inside and you can always see the health of uh, those plants how they are growing from time to time so the analysis based on artificial intelligence can also be done which is based on machine learning right in the end so this is also another interesting application and next we can move forward to uh, an application which i am linked with here in my institute i'm working on uh, trained uh, communication systems specifically uh, specifically for an antennas of course but i know the overall idea and how the project is going on. So in our project, uh, as well as in some other uh, research institutes, they are talking about this term, train integrity. Now I'll briefly give you an example of what it means with an example, right? So we have our trained uh, coaches traveling from cities to cities. They have multiple coaches and engines, right? So what if uh, we have a train which carry cargo, right? So those trains, uh, freight trains, we call them. So th those trains have a large number of coaches having the uh, needed cargo being carried between the cities or between the industrial plants even, right? So they have uh, even 50, 60 or 70 uh, coaches, train uh, coaches connected to the engine and they are traveling, right? But what if, and this is a real scenario, what if while being on the journey in between because of some mechanical fault or some mechanical uh, accident one of the coach gets uh, derailed or gets disconnected from the train body and the train continues its journey because there is only one uh, train engineer or train pilot uh, in the engine room that's it no one is observing anything from the on the other coaches right so in between the cities what if the train coaches maybe three or four or ten of the coaches in the end of the train gets disconnected from the train and driver will will not be knowing that for, for a long time until it will reach to next station and the driver decides to count the number of train coaches right so to solve this problem there is this concept of train integrity integrity here means to have the train uh, uh, connections the coach connections uh, checked all the time to be sure that they are connected. So for that, we have the onboard train integrity device, which is OTI, installed on all the coaches. And then connected to a ERTS system, which is actually a European standard, European Rail Traffic Management, which has several uh, uh, circuits or several communication networks through which the train operators can connect to the train. So what does this OTI device has? It has some onboard sensors like proximity center, sensors. So if, if I say I'll install OTI here and here on the ends of a coach and the, the OTI system, OTI device communicate or kind of have a connection through these sensors, which can be based on proximity detectors, which can be based on a RFID antenna, RFID system, or can be based on the UWB ultra wideband pulse-based system. So the, uh, in this, they continuously transmit pulse and the other system can receive that continuously. And if this stops, if this connection stops, so the driver can be right away informed or alarmed about the situation. So well in time, the coaches can be uh, tracked or can be known that if they are connected or not. And further to strengthen the whole concept of train integrity, there can also be another uh, onboard system, which is GNSS which is Global Navigational Satellite System, in which we have GPS, Galileo, or Indian Navigation System also, which India launched a couple of years back. So this can also be used for satellite-based positioning or localization of trains. So with this and the local sensors, a uh, very secure and safe way of getting the train integrity checked 
from time to time can be obtained, can be achieved. And this is what is being developed and what is being explored in our project, in the project that I'm attached with. Attached with some other researchers and partners are working. The companies, tra uh, railway companies of Europe, are contributing in that, and they are developing systems and solutions for it. And so this is like one of the application, uh, industrial IoT. I can see IoT on the train because we have sensors, we have data on it. We are getting the data, processing it, and analyzing the data. And based on that, we act either to uh, either to obtain like uh, the information. Okay, the train is all intact. It is all, uh, all integral, or if, if there is any problem. There can be some sensors on the railway wheels also to have it checked for the mechanical wear and tear. So there are so many solutions being explored, and they will be coming up in the near future on, uh, on the railway systems. We'll be seeing them to have our journeys being more uh, secure, being more efficient in all ways. OK, so these are some of the interesting applications under IoT. Next, another thing, another important uh, uh, term that I came across is, and I just want to touch upon this thing, which is Internet of Nano Things. So IoNT, another term uh, out of IoT. So it's just like based on the nano sensors. That's why Internet of Nano Things. We can have some in, uh, sensors which can be uh, inserted in inside the human body to uh, monitor to test some of the human body parameters, such as blood pressure, uh, oximetry, which is for oxygen levels, glucose levels. So all those sensors can be installed, and they are they has to be very small. So uh, that's why nano sensors, and they can communicate with the local uh, gateway, with the local device that we can have with us, and then further it can transmit the data to the internet. Further, that can be shared with the healthcare provider, doctors, hospitals, and all. And in this way, a healthcare monitoring system can be developed. So that's why this term came up, Internet of Nano Things, because we have multiple sensors in the body and that all communicate with the internet and external world. So we use nano sensors for all these monitoring. And I guess this is actually the current area of research being uh, worked on. And we'll be seeing some of the solutions in the coming years for this also. So that's quite interesting to work in this area also. So next, we can move on in a, on a special case of IoT, which is variable antennas. So we are all using these, actually, the variable devices, I will say. We are all using these. Uh, in the last couple of years, we uh, came to know about all these things. The uh, smart watches are the most popular ones. Then we have the smart uh, trackers, Fitbit and all. Then we have some other kind of devices which we can wear in the shoes, which we can have. Uh, on our shoulders and smart clothing and all these are also also coming up in the hospitals they have those uh, uh, smart uh, clothing on which the sensors are already installed and the monitoring can be done quite easily in the military applications they are the first ones who work on these technologies and who came up uh, with some of the solutions which further comes into into the market commercial market right so the military guys can also um, have are also having so many solutions with them for their soldiers to monitor their position, to monitor their vitals, to monitor their uh, video surveillance and all. They have all sorts of uh, installed devices on their clothing, right? So wearable antennas, uh, in that, we can start with the basic introduction to the body-centric communication. So we have three divisions in this. So when there is a networking between human self, humans, and human-to-human -human, uh, communication we have, so we use some wearable or implantable devices. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, yes. Uh, Naveen, sir, uh, sorry for interruption. Yes. There is a question from Radhika Chintamani. What yeah. signals they pick up, electrical or pressure signals? Uh, uh, they, I guess they are talking about the in-body sensors, right? Yes, sir. I guess they are okay. So as as in the previous slide, I showed so there I, is this uh, ECG, which is uh, the electrocardiogram uh, signals, uh, which we use the external device for. The doctors uses the external devices. So the internal sensors can be installed to pick up those signals from the heart. They are electrical form signals, right? And those signals can be transmitted in the form of data to have them visualized externally. So. In the human body, there can be different kinds of signals, electrical, they can be magnetic, there can be some chemical-based signals through uh, to which the sensors should operate. The sensors will work as per the type of signal, 
right? So the oximetry yeah, sensor yeah. can be a chemical sensor, which detects the oxygen level. The glucose uh, detection sensor can be based, a uh, chemical-based sensor, which will detect the glucose level. So those kind of different signals inside the human body can be detected with different kind of sensors. So this is, this is how it works. So I hope I answered uh, briefly the, the query. So I can continue, I guess. And later we can Thank have some so more queries and sure. question and answer. Uh, yeah. session. Okay, thank you. So moving ahead, uh, we were talking about body-centric communication. So here we have uh, the three uh, domains or three categories. And Professor Yang Hao from Queen Mary University and Professor Hall uh, from the same group, they are working in this domain very extensively. I will say in the last one, one and a half decade, they have been contributing to this field quite extensively and they are giving solutions actually to the industry also. So there is this uh, categorization of uh, uh, body centric com uh, communication, which is on body communication, like having different sensors or devices, which we wear on body. It can be in human body or outside the human body on the clothing and all. Then we have off body communication, which is like these sensors on human body communicates with some external points like wireless access points, or some cellular networks. And further, the third category can be a body-to-body -body communication. So two human beings or multiple, uh, many persons can communicate uh, with each other through these sensors, sharing the data. And finally, the data can further be shared to the network, which can be a wireless network or a cellular network. So these are the three domains. And we also uh, name it in this term, like wireless body area network, which is this having a network formed on human body. Then we have wireless sensor network, again, some sensors in or on human body forming a network. And then we have wireless personal area network. So humans having some sensors on body as well as some devices around them, like their smartphones, their laptops, or their uh, tablets and all. So all being connected to internet. So that forms wireless personal area network, right? So these terms are also quite popular and uh, technical terms which are being used in this domain. So moving ahead, what are the popular frequency bands which are being used for the body uh, area networks or human body communication uh, systems? So we have this MICS, Medical Implant Communication System. This, as the name uh, suggests, this is specifically the band to have some implant-based sensors or devices when we have to implant like capsules or some small devices inside the human body under the skin or in the human veins and all different uh, parts of the human body. So this is the band which is most popular or being assigned by the authorities. So this is medical implant communication systems based on this frequency band. Then we have the lessons free band of industrial scientific and medical uh, domain, which is ISM in which again, there is some frequency around 400 megahertz, we can see. There is a frequency band of 900 megahertz being assigned. And this is at the higher frequency range. So these three, if you see, are actually the bands for Wi-Fi, are actually the popular bands for Wi-Fi that we use in day-to-day -day life in our devices. We have these frequency being frequencies being used. Then very interesting uh, technology or frequency band is ultra wideband. And this is especially for those applications which supports higher data rate, very high data rate applications. So ultra wideband is assigned by FCC or ITU, the, the authorities, to have communication systems or devices being developed to support high data rate communication and short range communication. Another thing is short range communication using this technology or this range. So it's a very wide band of almost around 7.5 gigahertz, very wide spectrum only for this application. This is actually a pulse, uh, pulse application, pulse-based application, narrow pulses. Then we have very popular 2G, GSM, Global System for Mobile Communication, working on these bands popularly. Then we have personal communication services, again comes under 2G, but we use them for several other applications in this band. And finally, a new entry to this band recently in the last years is YGIG, or we can call also call it a millimeter wave band at 60 gigahertz a very high frequency 
And using this frequency, we have a very large bandwidth available for the communication, as well as the device size can be very, very, very small in terms of millimeter, I will say. The whole device can be just few millimeters in size because this will go into IC technology. We can have everything being developed in the integrated circuit technology. So this is also being explored and used for many applications, this range especially for body area networks also. So moving ahead, some basic requirements, although the requirements that I already discussed for IoT also applies here, but some additional requirements for wearables can be the form factor. Now here the form factor again covers the size, shape, weight of the device or of the antenna uh, in which uh, it will use, it will be used for wearables. So the form factor is very important. The overall weight, overall size and shape we have to consider while designing an antenna, uh, antennas for these uh, variables. Then the antenna gain and efficiency. So based on the technology, if we want the variable to just communicate with our mobile phone, and that is with us, right, or within our room, quite uh, shorter distance. So the gain doesn't have to be very high. It can be very nominal gain, 1 dB. We, we call uh, or we term gain in dB. So 1 dB, 1.5 dB, even 0 dB works. 0 dB. Now gain is actually... Uh, the radiation of antenna in a particular direction. It's not like uh, the signal is being enhanced. Gain is simply an antenna which radiates higher amount of energy in a particular direction. So we say antenna has a gain or some high gain in that direction. And also the efficiency. Now this is very important. I'll briefly touch upon this uh, term. Antenna we design, antenna engineer designed the antenna. But when the antenna is uh, installed or being worn by the human uh, by, on their body, on the shoulders, on their hands, the antenna parameter changes, the antenna properties changes because of the human body interactions. So, see, so the efficiency also reduces and this efficiency... Sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. I mean, sir, actually, Raksha has some uh, doubt. How did the experts know the bees were at ease with the foreign body? Okay, so first of all, as we all know that some of the trials were has to be all, uh, always conducted while experimenting with the living beings, right? So they had some trials and they have had they have the studies with them from the biologists and all those uh, areas uh, people working in other areas with animals like how much weight a bee can carry and if they install something what effect the bee can observe or that the bee can experience so going through with all those studies then further they decided to have their experiment continued so moving ahead is to have uh uh, analysis from the biologists, doctors, living being uh, uh, experts, and also from the authorities, the, the guidelines from the authorities. So based on that, they moved ahead with all that experimentation. So I hope I answered the query. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. So continuing, I was saying, uh, I was telling about efficiency. So antenna, okay, we designed the antenna, we installed the antenna in the device. But when us, the humans, wears the device, have the device on us, maybe a wristband or a watch, so our human body, the skin, the fat, the tissue, the bones, have different compositions and that affects the antenna operation. And that effect can be observed in, in terms of reduced efficiency. The antenna efficiency gets reduced and further this affects the power consumption of the antenna or whole device. So in that sense, we can say that a lower efficient antenna or a lower uh, efficiency device will consume more power. So the antenna and engineer should also take care of this requirement very carefully to have a higher efficient antenna, even in uh, touch with the human body, even if it is installed on human body, it has to maintain some higher level of efficiency. Then we have this important parameter. If us humans are wearing something which is like electromagnetic, which radiates and receives. So there is this term specific absorption rate, which is the absorption of electromagnetic exposure or energy by our human tissues or human body. So these considerations or these uh, values are already defined uh, by FCC and ITU 
and these are available online for mobile communication the level that is there is 1.6 watts per kg of human tissue 1.6 watts of uh, this uh, exposure per kg of human tissue so that is the allowed level and in uh, all of our mobile phones our watches smart watches and wearable tech this level has to be met by the manufacturers by the companies right so as of now for mobile communication the level is uh, this although for iot's i i'm sure they will have uh, much more strict guidelines or levels lower levels of exposure so that uh, it will be safer for longer use by humans right and the antennas has to have uh, the flexibility in terms of like uh, if we install the antenna on our shoulder or on on our wrist or on our legs it has to be flexible it has to have the flexibility of bent sometime or being crumpled or being pressed sometime but still operating stably or operating in a proper manner so these are some of the requirements in terms of antennas while we design it for variables now this is an example of a uh, uh, device uh, devices working in short personal communication networks or personal area networks we can say wireless person personal area networks so if uh, we see in this these examples of uh, these uh, figures so if you see there are some wi-fi access points base station of cellular as well as wi-fi technologies we have some mobile phones laptops pdas uh, so all these being connected with each other as well as connected to the network so this forms a wireless wireless personal area network how for this uh, lady we see there is a mobile phone there is a laptop so if they are connected this forms a her personal area, net area network either via bluetooth or wifi for this person his personal area network and so on and further if all of these are connected with each other this forms a, a personal wireless personal area network as a whole right so this is how a scenario can look like look like in a personal area network or personal communication network scenario which is of short range we can see it's a it's a very small area on an airport or somewhere then uh, we talk about like on body sensors or on body communication by variable so we can have several devices sensors on a, on a human body so blood pressure oximetry ecg some artificial pancreas being installed emg and some inertial sensors or movement sensors on our ankles or several other sensors you have a lot of them so they are being installed there being connected to the network further through a through a device either via bluetooth or some other technology and also to the internet so that the data can be stored or being processed by the healthcare professionals and others and right away we can also have the visual feedback on our device after the data being processed from the these sensors so we can see all these values and what does it mean is it high is it low so and accordingly we can consult to the healthcare professional so this is just a brief example how this healthcare tech can work having a variable based network right moving ahead the uh, brief uh, areas that few of it i a few of those i already discussed can be in military for sure we i guess every one of us know military uh, people are continuously working and developing and researching about all these technologies they are using even before us then it comes to our commercial market then healthcare for sure then uh, sports educational uh, industry industrial control for research for sure fashion agriculture and transport as i touched upon on few of these areas already in the uh, previous slides uh, yes priyanka any any more query i guess uh, sorry for interruption again so raksha has a question i guess he just wants to know. what's your opinion on the debate and negativity about 5g going on worldwide open okay. yes one more question uh, uh can you give some evidence using nanometer used signal captured electrode okay, in so medical I'll field okay i'll answer the first uh, question and i guess second question i was not able to hear it so i guess in the end i'm just about to finish in the end i can have that question again the second one right so the first question about 5g or the negativity or the fake news i will say uh being uh, spread 
by many people around the world, especially in UK, I have seen there was some uh, destruction of 5G um, sites also, 5G antennas also. So it's actually all fake or all uh, rumors, I will say. 4G is already being used by us, right? We have already all those sites, mobile sites and antennas around us, and we are using it very easily, very effectively. 5G is just being installed on those sites sites mostly and the areas which requires higher number of connections or higher data rate there will be more number of antennas in those areas only there will be more number of uh, installation in those areas only and still the frequency of operation will be same as 4g 3g 2g so there is no difference in the frequency of operation even the power level should be low will be low this is the main focus of 5g to have low powered technology standards so the the energy coming from those uh, antennas around us even from our devices it will be lower actually compared to 4g so in all sense 5g will be much more efficient much more advanced and it will be it will be low power technology it will be low energy technology and it will not have that much exposure EM, emf exposure which is electromagnetic exposure to humans using that technology. So it's all actually, uh, I'll just say it's all rumor and fake news that is being spread. So I guess rest of the question I'll just take in the end. I'm just about to finish in, I guess, few minutes. Yes, so sir. I'll just continue with the next slide. Sure, Thank you so much, yeah. Okay, sure. so few applications from right. variable uh, point of view. So just few, few minutes, five minutes more guys. Uh, I guess it is interesting, but I'll just continue with a few more interesting applications. These are some of the works done by some researchers around the world and being published online. Uh, the references are there at the bottom of the slides. So this is actually uh, a body variable antenna used for medical, you can, which can be used for medical applications for elder, elderly as well as ICUs and hospitals. So this is a printed antenna on human uh, clothing. So we can have this as an option and some device which will use this antenna, although it looks big. But of course, some research work can be done and is already being done to have it uh, miniaturized. Then we have some uh, uh, capsule-based antenna which can be uh, uh, inhaled or taken by the hu human, uh, taken by us, and inside the body it can transmit the required uh, information, either the oximetry level, either the, glu uh, the glucose level, either the blood pressure level, any kind of observation. And the sensor which is installed in the capsule, having this uh, antenna also, can transmit in terms of pulses. Here we see we have a UWB pulse generator. So it can transmit in terms of a pulse, uh, pulse based uh, communication and the data can further be processed and viewed. And then we have another interesting uh, application to have a smart clothing or antennas or systems in our clothing. So personal communication can be achieved through that. We, have, we can have a jacket which can have uh, some internal cellular board or Wi-Fi module, and we can have some antenna to which we can transmit some of the vital information or just for communication. It can be for both. So for per personal communication also, this kind of arrangement or some research was being presented in the last few years. Next, we can go ahead with the, some interesting things like uh, the antennas, which are uh, based on the clothings, like we use polyester, right? We use these, uh, uh, threads to design our shirts, t-shirts, and all those uh, clothing that we use. So we can have conductive threads. There is already availability of conductive threads through which we can um, have the embroidery done in terms of antenna shape. And that antenna can be excited by some signal and it can operate very easily. So this uh, patch of a cloth can be installed on any, any t-shirt, any polo, any shirt, any trouser. Uh, quite easily and it, it is a clothing material it's not like there is something conductive there is something which is not uh, fabric or textile so it's like a, a conductive uh, thread or conductive clothing we, we are, uh, uh, call them and we can use some basic embroidery machine using the thread to have different shapes of antenna so on the right also you can see there is some conductive thread being used to create a shape of an antenna and there is some excitation or ic uh, through which it can form an RFID system. This is actually an tag, RFID tag, which we use for identification or uh, detection purposes, right? So this can be installed on our clothing and it is a natural material, which is like a, a thread, 
uh, clothing, which will not be, uh, I, I'll say, which will not be uncomfortable also for us to have on our clothing, right? So this is uh, an interesting like uh, area in which uh, the antenna engineers are also operating in. Although it requires the knowledge of material science, people from physics, and all those things. Of course, the contribution should be from all the other areas. And then we have these applications, uh, which is again quite interesting. We can have some uh, special printers and special inks to print the antennas. It's not like we have to have a very uh, costly printers or industries to have the antenna manufactured. We can have the home printer kind of thing and we print the antenna shape and have the connector and connect, uh, connect it to the device. So this is like a on the go kind of a printing or designing of antennas. So these are flexible printable as well as low cost for like RFID and variable tech. Then we have uh, some biocompatible, biodegradable uh, antennas for biomedical applications or implants. This means these will not be foreign materials for human body. These will be like, uh, can be biodegradable or these will be compatible uh, biologically. So some of the inks are being developed in that area and some of the threads also are being developed. Then we have these uh, optically transparent antennas or reconfigurable antennas. Here on the right, you can see the latest uh, product proposed by AGC Glass, a company which manufactures glass bars, but it also works on the technologies which, we, which they can in, uh, incorporate in the glass. So they are coming up with the 5G base station antennas. They are coming up with this silica glass antenna, very small transparent antenna, uh, which operates on 5G. And they have a little big antenna which can be installed on a glass, which is transparent, and it can support 5G signals. It can transmit 5G signal to that floor or to that building. So in this way, you will not be having some aesthetic uh, uh, obstruction, aesthetic, uh, uh, I'll say, misconfiguration in your building. You have a glass building, and you install some router or something, and it will obstruct the view also, or it will not look good aesthetically. So aesthetics uh, are also important uh, uh, in our homes as well as industrial buildings and also that's why they are coming up with this glass-based antenna, which are transparent, right, mostly. So this is quite interesting. And finally, as I touched upon the SAR analysis, so this is uh, some, some work from my research group in Thapar uh, University. This is my work that I already published and, uh, did and actually this uh, is being done by many researchers around the world so uh, sorry this is to analyze the absorption uh, exp uh, the exposure of the antenna being de designed or the absorption by the human body so these are the models on the left you can see the model of uh, human body in the flat uh, domain this is like a cylindrical model to like uh, model the human wrist or human uh, upper hand and human thigh and human lower leg and all and this is the model for human head and hand because mostly the mobile phone on the right, you also you can see uh, an industrial physical model of this uh, simulated model. A human head filled with fluids which are having equivalent properties as our human brain has, human skin and tissues has, and also human hand which inside is filled with the fluids which are having equivalent properties as our human body uh, fluid has. So having these done during simulation is very important to know the level of absorption, to know the level of uh, SAR, as you call it, 1.6 watts per kg, it has to be lower than that. So these kind of analysis should be done already so that your antenna, at least in the simulation level, can confirm these standards. And while manufacturing it, having it prototype, you can have the physical measurements also. And with that, you can confirm that the antenna is ready to be used on human body and by the humans uh, quite easily without any fear of like uh, the exposure and all. So with this, I can conclude the presentation. I guess uh, this gave you an insight about all these IoT and variable tech and antennas. So it has a broad, uh, broad scope and social implications, social uh, constraints. It has limitless applications for sure. There are a number of devices and areas which are coming up, which will come up using IoT and variable tech. Variable electronics are, are is a very hot topic these days for many, many domains, a research topic for material science, physicists, electronics, computers, even mechanical civil or civil people who are working on like uh, transport and all where they have to install these systems also. So that's why it is interdisciplinary. 
the topic. So with this, I conclude my slide and uh, thank you very much. And very briefly, I'll just uh, give you information about this conference, which is coming up. I'm associated with this conference, which is International Conference on Electronics, Telecommunication and Information Processing, which will be on organized online. It will be a web conference. And this is the submission deadline. So I, inv I invite you all to contribute to your research and studies to this conference. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you like the whole presentation and talk. Thank you uh, very much, so sir, I'm... for this wonderful session. Uh, yeah. So we have some more questions. Uh, can I, uh, will you be able to uh, yeah. have the query questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. I'm available. So, uh, I'm available yeah. for the Okay, uh, Mohan has a question. Would you uh, please highlight on security consideration in home automation? In home, auto home automation, in I'll home say, automation. Uh, yeah, home automation, yeah. So in home automation, or we say the device is being connected within our homes yeah. with each other or with the network. So the security constraints or privacy concerns will be the same as we have currently with our Wi-Fi networks. So Wi-Fi networks not to not to uh, make them open, even being used within our home, not to be used by people around our home or people who are nearby our home. But for the devices inside our, our home, there are not many security concerns as such, because we are using the devices mostly within our home, with the network which is the Wi-Fi that is being used with uh, by us. But for that Wi-Fi network, we have to be sure it, it is secured with all kinds of uh, passwords and security uh, parameters. OK, yeah, okay, thank you, sir. So, so our question. next question is uh, from Narinda Singh. Yeah, he's saying, how can we minimize the side effects of radiation as we are becoming heavily dependent on these devices whose working depend on signals or electromagnetic waves? Okay, uh, very interesting question. Uh, we all, as a hum uh, as a human being, we are all concerned about this exposure, absorption. What does the uh, device uh, uh, has an effect on our body and all, right? So to reduce the effects or the exposure or the absorption by our body of these signals coming out, out of the variables, the mobile phones and all, the proposed techniques uh, which are there available in the market is specifically for antennas. For antennas, we can have uh, some reflecting surfaces. We can have uh, something based on metamaterials. This is another interesting topic, another interesting domain. So using those, we can have the energy being transmitted uh, away from the human body, not towards the human body. So this is one, one of the ways. And we can have some kind of an absorber between the device and human body so that the electromagnetic exposure can be minimum so that it will not affect too much. Okay, thank you so much, sir. And uh, we have one more question from uh, Raksha. Actually, uh, a lot of questions from Raksha. Uh, she's asking, then why are people so concerned about 5G and creating issues Okay. And so, also, what are the yeah, social I, Im implications? Okay. So, yeah, uh, I know that people are having this in mind who are, like I'll say, general public who are not uh, connected with the technical terms and technical know how. So, people are creating this uh, rumors or this kind of a mess, like destroying the sites of 5G uh, uh, communication systems and all. Because I don't know, they want something to be created uh, uh, against the technology. They think that uh, new technology is not good. New technology will be bad in terms of the radiations and all. But as I told uh, you earlier, it will be having lower power, lower radiation uh, constraints compared to 4G. So with 5G, it's not like it will have very high power. We have to have a very large amount of devices being supported. So there has to be many antennas and ready to in high power uh, signal. So this is not the case. It will be almost similar to 4G network and much better than that, much more efficient.
Okay. And our next question is uh, from uh, Raksha as well. What are the social implications? Uh, social, implications, social implications, I'll say, yeah, this will, I guess this is, and this will be a point to take, uh, to be taken care of by the manufacturers and uh, telecom companies. Because if, uh, of course, in areas, as I, as I told you, where more number of devices has to be supported, uh, higher data rate will be required. So there has to be more number of antennas for sure. But the antennas will be, will be very small, of course. And they can be installed on the light uh, poles, on the signboards or traffic lights uh, in our localities and all. But of course, there will be a uh, more number of antennas around us. So the manufacturers and telecom operators should take care of uh, making them aesthetically good they can uh, they can be like well uh, i will say camouflage in our surroundings so that they will not Flash. be visibly uh, i'll say not good to see all around us antennas and antennas and antennas all around us so in that sense the social implication will be the the, the i'll say human uh, thinking it will get affected of course if we'll see antennas around us we'll see it's a lot of radiation we are having again the the talk will start why we have so many antennas around us why there is so much ex so much exposure and there can be some, some agitation for that so these are the social implications that the companies has to take care of and they have to think Yes, sir. That's all for today. I guess uh, all the our audience get all uh, their answers. And uh, thank you once again for such wonderful session, Naveen, sir. It was indeed great pleasure to have you as an expert. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers. I'll repeat uh, to have my thanks to Tech Counselor and Tulas Institute and all so to the organizers for inviting me and i look forward uh, to the future talks and future events by you so i hope everyone is uh, yeah, staying sir. safe and taking all the precautions and stay at home uh, as much as you can yes yeah. thank yes sir thank you so much once so, uh, okay thank you very thank much for your valuable time and we will conduct our 1 pm again Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, then. Bye, everybody. Bye.